Well, hey, Saints, this is a different one. Um, I was getting ready for my Sunday school class tomorrow, and I'm, I was on a business trip to Costa Rica, and the Trialba volcano canceled my flights, and so I'm going to miss my adult Sunday school and hopefully still get back home on Sunday, but uh, things are a little iffy right now. So I was thinking, you know, I'd started getting ready for that Sunday school class and there were some neat things in here and I thought well I'll just record a video and hopefully you know everybody can be blessed a little bit maybe some of the stuff I found was interesting for you so uh, this was going to be the last Sunday school class uh, until fall if we're still here <laughs> and uh so I had asked people, because we finished, I did, I think it was three or four weeks on pre-tribulation rapture, um, and taking a look at both the plain text and all the um, types and shadows and all that type of thing. But I said, you know, for the last class, <clears throat> um, what did people want to do in terms of questions that need to be answered or whatever, and... Um, I received one question for this coming week, and it was it was a hard one. <laughs> uh, you guys probably know this, but uh, the question was, can I explain in Daniel 12, there's references to 1290 days and 1335, and there's speculation all over the place, but if you're serious about digging into it and you don't want to just be on wild you know fanciful trip of you know counting crazy things um you'll see that the you know the theologians and the commentaries and all that are really stumped by what that means at the end i mean the obvious speculation is that it has something to do with setting up the millennial reign. But we're going to take a look at some passages here. Hopefully this is going to be a blessing for everybody. But So that the question was, ex, trying to explain those. And as I said, you know, it's like, yikes. Um, let's go take a look at uh, a little snippet of a Chuck Missler video. And he kind of encapsulates... Uh, the challenge here, let's put it that way. So hang on. Um, here we go. Reserved until the end. Daniel's book was sealed until the end. What's interesting in recent years is more and more of Daniel is just opening up. That in itself, is in a sense, is a fulfillment of prophecy. And uh, I remember I had a very vivid experience. Um, I was in a, uh, uh, a routine back in those days where I operated out of Big Bear, and uh, I would go down the hill, about an hour and a half drive down to, uh, to Torrance to uh, do a Tuesday night uh, study at Hal Lindsey's church in Torrance. And after I did the service, I'd go and stay at his home up in, in uh, uh, Palos Verdes, and he had a guest room there, and I'd, I'd show up at uh, you know, 11 o'clock, whatever it was, and then we'd wrap until 2 or 3 in the morning in a study about various things. The, the following morning at, at, at a local Marie Calendars, I did a men's Bible study, and then I went back up uh, home to uh, up at Big Bear. So I'd come down Tuesday, do the Tuesday night, Wednesday morning, and oh, that was my cycle every week for a period of time. And I can remember one time, because I was wrestling with Ezekiel 38 in my studies, and I discovered something that startled me, because everybody wonders who Gog is. Gog and Magog of Ezekiel 38, because it's very unlike the Holy Spirit to introduce a major... A person of some kind without some background, and there's no background. But uh, I, I discovered in the in Amos, chapter seven, verse one, not in the not in the Masoretic text, and thus the English, but out of the Septuagint, it happens to read very differently than the Masoretic. A small subtlety in the Hebrew causes the difference. Uh, the, the, the 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 way it's translated in the English Bible makes no sense at all, frankly, um, and it's, neither does the Masoretic. But the the Septuagint reads just subtly different. Speaks of some locusts. It says uh, that um, some uh, they were, the locusts were coming, and the, the young, devastating locust was Gog, their king. 
And I thought, wow, that's because I, from, from when you study Revelation 9, you know there the locusts are demon locusts because they have a king, Abaddon and destroy, you know, he has these names. And you know from Proverbs 30, verse 27, that the real locusts have no king. So the fact that the locusts in Revelation 9 have a king is a tip-off that these aren't natural locusts, they're, it's an idiom for demons, you follow me. Well, anyone that's been through that study, when you discover Gog is the king of the locusts, you realize he's a demon king. And what startled me about that was I didn't find that in any of the commentaries. I just happened to stumble it by, by another man. So that had happened when I went down the hill to did my Tuesday night thing at, 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 at House Church. I did my usual thing. When I got to home that, with him that night, sat in a study, says, Hal, have you? And I was, I was blown away because I said, first, was, am I wrong? So he reached up and he got his copies down and we, we checked it out. No, it's absolutely right. It's, a, it's, it's, it's not only is, are you correct, it's not even a variant reading that is the correct in the Septuagint. Well, he took it all in stride. I was stunned. Because here I'm just a layman. I came across something I couldn't find in the commentaries. He wasn't surprised at all. I was stunned because, you know, wow, because all of us have traveled in Ezekiel 38, 39 for decades. It's, it's familiar ground. And here to discover something that, it, it blew me away. And uh, I was excited, and when, especially when he confirmed it, and because he's quite a scholar and a uh, 35-year Greek scholar. But anyway, he... Uh, he wasn't surprised. I said, Chuck, that's, that's Daniel 12, 4. What? Said, What's that? He, the knowledge shall be increased. He, he, he also pointed out the knowledge. The knowledge of the, of the scripture will be increased. It should not surprise us that discoveries will be made, not necessarily by experts, just by the Holy Spirit, whatever, um, but that, we, that, that things are opening up. We understand things today that we never did before. The intelligent arrows of Jeremiah 59. You all have our little lists of little nuggets here and there. But the point is, we should not be surprised that, um, uh, that our understanding of the Scripture is increased, especially as we raise our standards of interpretation. The more literally you take it, the more it unravels. It's when you start compromising with it and allegorizing it, you get, into, you get down in these bramble bushes. So be careful about that. But anyway, that's so much for verse 4. Let's move on. Um, verse 5. Then I, Daniel, looked, and behold, there stood other two, the one on this side of the bank of the river and the other on that side of the bank of the river. And one said to the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, How long shall it be to the end of these wonders? And some scholars, by the way, visualize Christ and two angels here, but that's conjecture. There's no, uh, it is what it is. One said to the, uh, to the man clothed in the linen, a third in other words, which was upon the waters of the river, how long shall it be to the end of these wonders? Well, boy, we'd like to know that. That's a good question. And I heard the man clothed in the linen, which was upon the waters of the river, when he held up his right hand and his left hand unto heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever, that it shall be for a time, times, and a half. And when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. So here's again one of these weird references to three and a half years. Three and a half years, remember we saw it in Dan, Daniel chapter 7, verse 25. We saw it in Daniel uh, uh, 12, 7 here. We've seen it in Revelation 11, 2. We've seen it in Revelation 13 and a half. In some places it's called three and a half years, another place it's called 42 months, another place it's called 1260 days. And it all cranks out, you know, yeah, that's, that's, that's uh, three and a half years, it's, it's uh, 42 uh, uh, months of 30 days each, it all runs out to 1260 days. So we've encountered that again and again, it's the most documented period of time in the entire Bible, Old and New Testament. But here we have something else that should echo in our memory from Revelation chapter 10 and other places. He raised his right and left hand and swear by him that liveth forever. He's taking an oath here. And we shall accomplish to scatter the power of the holy people. All these things shall be accomplished. And I heard, but I understood not. This is Daniel talking. I heard and I understood not. Then said I, O oh my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? Before I go on, by the way, it's interesting to see that Daniel is recording material that he did not understand. I am so tired of reading books on hermeneutics that always insist that we have to interpret the, the passages 
as the writer understood them. That seems reasonable at first, except it's contrary to experience. You can find places in the scripture where the person is faithfully recording it and has the foggiest notion of what the Holy Spirit's intending with this stuff. It's only with later that we look back and understand it. And uh, uh, so that's what we call inspiration. That's guided by the Holy Spirit. And uh, it should be very, very cautious about trying to confine the Word of God into the understanding of the penman. Because uh, I can understand the caution on the one hand, but you take it with a grain of salt. Because here's one example. Because Daniel's recording all this stuff, but he did not understand it. He just presumed that his forebears, the re you the readers, would be able to re relate to it more than he can. But he then turns says, Oh my Lord. That's another reason why I think the third person, the one in the middle, is Jesus Christ. Anyway, Oh my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And he said, Go thy way, Daniel. And uh, the word go here isn't physical. It's more of a mental attitude kind of thing. Your words are sealed, but you keep, you keep going here. He said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. And one of the reasons we're increasingly confident that we're moving into the time of the end because we're increasingly being able to put so many obscure prophecies together to make, a, to make sense. It's becoming very clear. Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. Wow. And from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away, and the abomination that maketh desolate set up, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. And this has puzzled scholars. The libraries are full of conjectures because everybody knows that half the week is 12, three and a half years is 1260 days. But from the abomination of desolation, it goes 1260 plus 30. What's that 30 for? We have no idea. We know that the, the, the tribulations come to an end at 1260, but there's a 30 day window here. So you find scholars presuming that maybe that's the time it takes to face the judgment. There's all kinds of things that happen after the Christ sets up, his, he sets up his kingdom. That doesn't happen in, in one day. Some argue there's some aspects of it that may take 30 days. That's their conjecture. We don't know. But it gets worse. Verse 12. Blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the thousand three hundred and five and thirty days. 335. So apparently after 1260 you got the 30 days from, from verse 11 you got another 45 days on top of that uh, until, you see, it says there shall be, you see, from the time the daily sacrifice should be taken away and the abomination that make death set up, there shall be 1,290 days. We don't know what that means. It may be the formal setting up of the kingdom or something. But then he has an interesting extra blessing here. Blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the 1,305 and 30 days. We have no idea. There's 30 plus 45. There has been someone that, that has done some calculations having to do with bearing the Ark of the Covenant on the shoulders of Levites from Axum to Jerusalem as taking about that time. But that's conjecture. That's conjecture. Who knows? But the final words, But go thou thy way till the end be. For thou shalt rest and stand in thy lot at the end of the days. And so ends the Book of Daniel. Okay. Well, uh, see, what I liked about that little chunk there was he talked about the end days being marked by the Holy Spirit inspiration, even to non-professionals. <laughs> and I'm hoping the Lord's done that with me a few times. Um, it's a blessing when when he drops something on you. I think that's where we're at today, saints, but I'm just being careful because, you know, scripture isn't of private interpretation, but situations like this where the people have studied this for decades say, don't know what this means or, or speculate, here's what it might mean. But I think the Holy Spirit might have showed us something today. So that's where we're going to go with this. Um, he also mentioned, I'll, I'll take off two things because we just saw the video. One is he said, 
it's a ridiculous assumption that um, the prophet that was recording the scripture being given would have to understand it. And he said, you know, that gets called out when people talk about hermeneutics. And I'll just put a little twist on that. I mean, I, I agree because Daniel didn't know what was going on in a couple of the prophecies he was getting, he was given. And then the apostle John in the book of Revelation, a couple of times was asked, you know, what is this? And he goes, you know, you know, <laughs> he basically was telling the angel, I don't know what you're showing me, you know, you know, um, so I agree with the, you know, the point he was making there, but I'll put a little, you know, addition on that or twist is uh, the text when it's written down is in the context of the prophet that was receiving it. So I'll just use his example there. He was studying the Gog Magog war. Well, to Daniel and to Ezekiel, you know, same time frame, right? Who Gog was, who, where Magog was, uh, where Persia was, and all the other things listed in Ezekiel 38, 39, had to be in the context in the, that case of what Ezekiel would have known those areas to be. So the prophet didn't need to understand everything, but it had to be in terms of, of the time frame he lived in, you know, so I think that's a, you know, parses a little bit better in terms of the way it's actually applied. And then the second thing I'll note, and I'm not debating with Dr. Missler because, hey, he's a theologian, <laughs> nobody, <laughs> but he, he had that discovery in Amos 7 that Gog was the leader of a locust army and several videos ago, we really dug into that and uh, well by implication he said well the locust army is there in Revelation 9 but Dr. Missler also talks about you know the Gog Magog war as maybe even being pre rapture of the church and so obviously those things can't line up because Revelation 9 is in the tribulation period <clears throat> if he's talking about the picture there of Gog being the head of the locust army in and comparing it to Revelation 9, he's in the tribulation. So there's a little bit of a, you know, maybe he doesn't know where it belongs, but he was making that association. But, you know, several videos ago, we took a look. I'm, we're pretty sure, I'm pretty sure that the Gog Magog war is pictured in seal four of Revelation six. And that it isn't demons, but it's more likely non-humans, the Nephilim. And maybe at the end of this video, we'll, I'll tag on another passage that kind of points to that. I think it's in Isaiah 24. But yeah, it's non-human and Gog's the head of it. But I, I think it's uh, the Nephilim army. And there's a whole bunch of reasons why. It's positioned there in the uh, CO4 time frame. And it's confirmed with what you read in Joel 1 and then especially Joel 2 and the like. So I'll parse a couple of things there just because I had some differences. But maybe that's, hopefully that's a little bit of the Holy Spirit inspiration here in the end of days, giving us a little bit better insight like you talked about. But um, Okay, let's go back to our our study then. Um, so we saw that you know the scholars are all wrapped around the axle about how to treat those time frames right at the end of uh, Daniel. Now I know this is <clears throat> going to be a little bit of a, a read through here but I think it's important because we have to read the full context that leads into why Daniel was talking about those days and time frames at the end of Daniel. So what I want to do is go read Daniel 11:30 to the end and then come in and burn through Daniel 12 and then camp at those verses that Dr. Missler just read. So let's go do that. 
Okay, we're in Daniel 11, thir starting in verse 30. For the ships of Chittim shall come against him, therefore he shall be grieved and return and have indignation against the holy covenant. So shall he do. He shall even return and have intelligence with them that forsake the holy covenant. An arm shall stand in his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and they shall take away the daily sacrifice, and they shall place the abomination that maketh desolate. Now we got to pause right there. The, the, this, these two verses were perfectly pictured with the deeds of Antiochus Epiphanes there in 167 BC. But the curious thing, and again, we did a whole video looking at this, is there's three references in Daniel to the abomination of desolation. It's there in Daniel 9, uh, 27. It's here in Daniel 11:31, and it shows up again in Daniel 12, which we'll read. And yet, when Jesus himself was talking about the end days to the Jewish people in Matthew 24, he put he referenced uh, the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel. He didn't parse which one because it's in there three times. So I, the curious thing here is, even though Antiochus Epiphanes fulfilled these verses to a T in the <clears throat> in the prior couple of verses, I think there's a final fulfillment with the Antichrist or what Jesus said in Matthew 24 wouldn't make sense. So. Um, they'll place the abomination that make it desolate. Okay. And such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he corrupt by flatteries. But the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. And again, that sounds just like the Maccabees, but it will happen again in the end of the age. That might even be a reference to the 144,000 because they'll be bouncing around doing witness, right? And they that understand among the people shall instruct many, yet they shall fall by the sword, and by flame, and by captivity, and by spoil many days. Now, we also see that picture there in Zechariah, you know, the end times picture in Zechariah 12, chapter 12 through 14. But you, you see two-thirds in, in uh, Zechariah 13 of the Jewish people being killed. So it's uh, serious, and you know these are flowing in order. Now when they shall fall, they shall be helping with a little help. But many shall cleave to them with flatteries. And some of them of understanding shall fall and to try them and purge and make them white even until the time of the end, because it's yet for an appointed time. Now, hopefully your ears perked up if you haven't already spotted that. This is a Moed. So I just want to be real careful now. The time of the end, and this is a reference to the Jewish people, the time of the end is for an appointed time. We're going to be pretty careful here in Daniel 12. We need to talk about the people. We need to talk about the temple. And we need to talk about the final fulfillment the Abrahamic covenant, the land grant. So this verse is in reference to the people, and it's for an appointed time, a moed, which is you know one of the feasts from Leviticus 23. Hope you can hold that in your brain. <laughs> I think this video might be a little bit long, but it it could be really cool. So I beg you to hang on. Um, and the king shall do according to his will, and shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god, and shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods, and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished, for that is determined shall be done. Now that phrase should ring bells of Daniel 9, 27. And again, we'll have to go back and reference that. But the indig indignation, you know, the Antichrist in Jerusalem with the abomination of desolation set up in the temple is is going to run to the end of the tribulation period if you want to you know kind of parse what is it saying here 
Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor any God, for he shall magnify himself <clears throat> above all. But in his state he shall honor the God of forces. Hang on. <clears throat> and I just want to point out that that God of force, forces, fortresses, I guess it was, um, is translated like in the Septuagint to Mazim. And according to several sources, that name as a proper name <clears throat> might be a reference to Allah, you know, of the Muslim faith. And so folks that see, you know, the Muslim Antichrist probably could use a verse like this. You know, but there's there's a lot of issues with the Antichrist and I don't want to get into it. I just wanted to point that out because it's a curious, you know, thing that's in there. Okay. <clears throat> Thus shall he do in the most strongholds with a strange God, whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory, and he shall cause them to rule over many, and shall divide the land for gain. And in the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind, with chariots and horsemen, and with many ships, and he shall enter into the countries, and shall overflow and pass over. He shall enter in also to the glorious land, and many countries shall be overthrown, but these shall escape out of his hand, Edom, Moab, and the chief of the children of Ammon. He shall stretch forth his hand also upon the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. But he shall have power over the treasury, treasures of gold and silver, <clears throat> over all the precious things of Egypt, and the Libyans and the Ethiopians shall be at his steps. But tidings out of the east and out of the north will trouble him. Therefore he shall go forth with great fury. Oh, I see we're running off the bottom here. And he shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas and the glorious mountain. Yet he shall not, let me see if I can scroll this up. He shall, <laughs> sorry about that. He shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas of the glorious mountain. Yet he shall not come to his end and none shall help him. He'll come to his end and none shall help him. Okay, let's uh, go back and. Deal with the next part. <laughs> Say it plainly. The Antichrist being thrown down. Um, and so it sort of caps off that rebellion <clears throat> of the Antichrist. Now 12 is short. And so, you know, hang with me. We're getting really to the interesting stuff here. And at that time shall Michael stand up the great prince which, which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time, and that at that time thy people shall be delivered, and every one shall be found written in the book. And again, Daniel is talking about the children of thy people. And so this is a reference again to the people. It's recapping, you know, that that this period of time that we just read about is going to be the worst possible for the Jewish people. And that again matches Matthew 24, the time of the great tribulation, Jesus said, again, for the Jewish people. And then Jeremiah 30, you see it's the time of Jacob's trouble. And so these things all line up, but he's just recapping here that that, that set of passages we read from the abomination of desolation being set up to the end, right? That's what we just read. Was about the Antichrist defiling the temple and his reign of terror to the Jewish people until the end of him being put down. Okay, so that brings us up to current there. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall wake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And now, you know, even many of the rabbis say that's a reference to the resurrection of the Old Testament saints. 
and positionally here it's right after the discussion of the persecution of the Jews by the Antichrist having been finished and so it's like the next thing in the program for the Jews after the Antichrist is put down is the resurrection of the Old Testament saints and they that be wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever but thou O Daniel shut up the words and seal the book even till the time of the end many shall run to and fro and knowledge shall be increased and again referencing back to Dr. Missler's video there <clears throat> it's the knowledge shall be increased meaning most likely knowledge of the Bible and scripture then I Daniel looked and beheld there stood two one on one side of the bank of the river and the other on the other side of the bank of the river and one said to the man clothed in linen which was upon the waters of the river how long shall it be until the end of these wonders and I heard the man clothed in linen which was upon the waters of the river when he held up his right hand and his left hand unto heaven and swear by him that liveth forever it shall be for a time times and a half when he shall accomplish to scatter the power of the holy people these things shall be finished <clears throat> now I hope you caught that how good is that he's talking again specifically about the Jewish people and it's a time times and a half period here when the uh, Jewish people will have uh, it'll be the termination to the end is what I'm trying to say when the power of the Jewish people has been broken meaning the final of the persecution from the Antichrist here is a times time and a half you know it's pointing to back to the time frame probably of when the Antichrist uh, defiles the temple again if we just hold the context that we're trying it's in that time frame okay now I'm gonna show you something when I was studying this out um, a couple of things came to me that he's going to deal with the people then the temple and then the land grant um, but I went down a bunch of bunny trails looking at all the commentaries with all the speculation some of the commentary just said uncle kind of like Dr. Missler we don't know you know or someone provides some speculation um, but the interesting thing is is you know just like Dr. Missler found his little gold nugget of Amos 7 in the Septuagint I think I found a few little gold nuggets here in a version of the Septuagint probably not the same one that Dr. Missler used um, and so let's bounce over to the the Nets Septuagint which is a, a translation that was documented for the book of Daniel it was in uh, like 135 AD and the reason why you do this is <clears throat> is you're trying to get closer and closer and closer to the to when the uh, recording of the passages actually happened and in the case of the Old Testament that we find in our Bible you know Dr. Missler mentioned this that was the Masoretic text which was you know finally put down in 900 AD but if you can see translations of the text that they had of the Old Testament earlier time frames you're probably getting closer and closer to the original text that was documented and so that's why I'm going to the Nets Septuagint here this I'll say this book of Daniel this fragment really of Daniel was translated in I think it was like 135 AD um, it's called the Theodosian translation and let's just read here now it's starting at verse 7 and I heard a man clothed in um, sorry I gotta increase the font my glasses aren't hold, helping me clothed in Baden who was above the water 
of the stream, and he raised his right hand and his left hand toward heaven, and he swore by means of one of one who lives forever, pertaining to a time, times, and a half a time, when the dispersion is completed, they will know all these things. Okay, now that is really interesting. Um, so you, so the persecution by the Antichrist and the ending of the time, times, and half a time that, you know, Dr. Missler said was coming potentially from a pre-incarnate Christ standing over this river, but at least an angelic being of some sort was standing over the river and made this declaration and swore by God that this was the, the end for the Jewish people. Now, I don't have time to go retill all this ground, but I'm very convinced that Rosh Hashanah is the time frame of the regathering of the Jewish nation. And that's just what we read. This, this verse right here, oh, sorry, I meant to bring up the Septuagint. Um, is one that dispersion is completed. Now, I'll just make reference to when you get to the end of Matthew 24, first you need to know the context of Matthew is to the Jewish people. When you get to the end of the descrip uh, description of the tribulation in Matthew 24, about two-thirds of the way down, it also talks about some will be taken and some will be left. And then the question is where? And then what it says in Matthew 24, where the eagles are, there the carcasses will be. And what's, you know, the interpretation of that passage is the ones taken are going to be taken into judgment. And you can see the judgment occurring in Ezekiel 20, starting at verse 33 to the end. It's not the rapture being pictured down there. It's this, it's the dispersion is being completed. All the Jews from, from out all the world and possibly even those resurrected Jews, um, the Old Testament saints, are being brought back and um, they're going to pass under the shepherd's rod is what it says in Ezekiel 20. The rebels will be purged out. And then they'll be brought into the promised land. And right here uh, in Daniel 12, 7, again, using the Septuagint version here, it says this is the time frame for the end of the dispersion. See how perfect <laughs> these scriptures line up? I just got really excited. There's three little nuggets right in a row here. That's the first one. And it's relating to a time, times, and a half a time. Okay, dispersion completed. And I, I put 1260 in here. I mean, it was actually referenced as a time, times, and half a time. So I, I just want to be careful with that. Um, so if the dispersion is completed, and if you guys know the trumpets are both the call of the sac sacred assembly, and it's a, a warning to the Jewish people and Rosh Hashanah. You guys know this, that 10 days of awe then after Rosh Hashanah is for repentance for the Jewish people under the law. They were supposed to repent for the deeds of the year. And then on Yom Kippur, at the end of that repentance period, was the final sealing of the judgment. So they were determined, you know, of course, everybody is a sinner. So they were determined guilty. The determination is on Rosh Hashanah. Ten days to repent. Then the fate is sealed on Yom Kippur. And that's why I think that Ezekiel 20 passage explains when these Rosh Hashanah, ten days on Yom Kippur, find their final fulfillment. Because again, it's to the Jewish people and they need to be judged. Judgment starts at the house of the Lord. Then you see the Gentile nations judged. 
based on how they treated the Jewish people during the tribulation period. That's what's going on with the sheep and goat judgment in Matthew 25. And again, it flows in order, right? After the tribulation period, you'll see the Jewish people, some taken, some left, pulled out of you know, the world. The Jewish people will be separated. They'll be brought in, Ezekiel 20, for their judgment. They'll pass under the shepherd's rod, and their fate will be sealed. Now that explains then how you get only believers of the Jewish people coming back into the promised land with Christ at the head, bringing him back into Jerusalem, for instance, to set up the millennial reign. That's also the time frame here on earth of when the marriage supper of the Lamb takes place. You can compare that to Revelation 19, again, end of the tribulation period, after the seven years of the church being in heaven is complete, Revelation 19 talks about the return of Christ with his saints for the marriage supper of the Lamb. So here you go. The Jews then having been judged, being brought back into the land of Israel, and then the setup of the millennial reign, what happens is they're going to be brought into the marriage wedding of the Lamb, and the Jewish people are the attendants and the guests, and the bride is the church. So when you take a look at Matthew 25, starting in verse 1, where it talks about the foolish and wise virgins, the virgins are the wedding guests. They're the, <clears throat> they're the um, helpers to the bride, but they aren't the bride. You can't mix the metaphors there. Just like John the Baptist, when he was asked who he was, he explained um, the one that was, you know, to make straight the paths of the Lord, but he also described himself as friend of the bridegroom, right? So you can see the Jewish people are not the bride. They're, they're the wedding attendants when it comes to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Hope that's not too much for you because this is so cool, <laughs> at least in my mind. Um, and I just want to go on to explain then. So you've got the return of the dispersion being completed according to that Septuagint version. That then starting Rosh Hashanah, which is the judgment beginning, 10 days of awe, Yom Kippur, judgment is sealed. The next feast that's right on the heels, four days later or whatever of Yom Kippur, is Sukkot or Tabernacles. Now I want to read you something here. Um, hang on, let me launch this. Okay, let's just take a look at this current year in Torah calendar just so you can see the flow of what we're talking about here. Here's Rosh Hashanah. That's, again, when I believe the Lord is going to gather the Jewish people at the end of the tribulation from all throughout the world. And then you have the 10 days of awe. You see him being counted there. And then you have Yom Kippur. That's when the judgment is sealed. Then you have this handful of days here, four days in between. And then you get to the Feast of Sukkot, or Tabernacles. So can you imagine this picture? I think actually the Lord's going to bring him back to the original Mount Sinai in Arabia because all the historical artifacts are still laying below that mountain. Um, again, if you don't know, there's been tons of videos now documenting Mount Sinai in Arabia. Go take a look at the artifacts. They'll blow you away. So if God returns them all back to the mountain, wouldn't that just smoke their mind when they see the remnants of the original gathering of the Jewish people at the base of the mountain where they read, you know, God was offering a marriage to the Jewish people at that point to be separate and holy unto the Lord, but they rebelled. They didn't want to hear from the Lord. They told Moses, you go talk to him, right? They, they rebelled and rejected. So now I believe he's going to bring them back to that same area 
again with two thirds of the Jews unfortunately dying in the tribulation period there in Zechariah 13 you would have about a million and a half two million Jews exactly the same number as what originally left out of Egypt back in the original Exodus about the same number at the base of the mountain wouldn't that just be an awesome circular pattern and then after the the judgment after Yom Kippur when the rebels get <clears throat> cut out or is going to probably send the rebels you know somewhere uh, you know Sheol right then they're going to uh, celebrate the time of tabernacles and I, I think they're going to do this still in the wilderness I just want to show you something quick even the reading for the beginning of Sukkot is Zechariah 14 1 through 21 don't have time to look into it but it's awesome. This is just exactly what we're talking about. It's painting the picture of the return of all the Jews, you know, at the end of the age, after the tribulation period, Zechariah 14. It's awesome that that's what's in there. Okay. I know I'm pretty fired up. I hope you're tracking this because it, I think it's pretty darn cool. Okay, now let's keep reading in Daniel 12. So we got the return of the Jewish people from all over the globe we've got the Rosh Hashanah 10 days of awe Yom Kippur judgment sealed rebels have been you know spun out into outer darkness they celebrate tabernacles I think right at the base of the mountain would be my guess now let's finish reading in the Septuagint version where we see the 1290 days and the 1335 days um, being talked about. Okay, we left off, let me increase this font. We left off at verse 7. Scroll her down here. Oh, not that far. Okay, there we go. Perfect. So we read 7. Here's eight. And I heard and did not understand. And I said, Sir, what will be the end of these things? And he said, Go, Daniel, for the words have been barred and sealed until the time of the end. Let many choose to be made white and be refined. And the lawless act lawlessly. And the lawless will not understand. And the intelligent will understand. So that just demonstrates the Lord is going to purge out the rebels just like we talked about again go read Ezekiel 20 read the whole chapter you'll both you'll see the original Exodus and the situation being discussed at Mount Sinai and then you'll see this return of all Israel back to the wilderness to be judged at the end of the age and from the time of the removal of the regular offering and the abomination of desolation will be given 1290 days now that to me the, the problem is it sounds like he's going to give us the time period and he says and from the time of the removal of the regular offering and the abomination of desolation will be given 1290 days and so <clears throat> it you know you have to go back somewhere at the midpoint of the tribulation period when the uh, Antichrist enters the temple and declares himself as God, he s puts an end to the uh, sacrifice and offering. And you see that in Daniel 9, uh, you know, 27 there. And then that's the time frame he puts up that abomination of desolation. And again, that's confirmed with the midpoint of Matthew 24. So, He's talking about now, though, that this is talking about the temple. So we just moved from the consummation and the conclusion of what happens to the Jewish people until they're purged out and all they have is believers in Christ. Now he's talking about the temple. And in case of the temple, we've got 1,290 days. Now this one's a little less clear but I think we still have something interesting here saints 
So 1290 days, and he's talking about the temple. Now, that passage in Daniel 12:11 said, you know, the destruction and the defiling of the temple. And then he gives 1290 days. He doesn't say what the end point is, but we're talking about the temple. And we know the temple is going to be restored. And I want to just go back and look at the original prophecy. You know, there's two of them there that flow in a row. The prophecy from Gabriel in Daniel 9, and then starting in Daniel 10, he paints the rest of the end time picture for Daniel. So 10, 11, and 12 are basically one long end time picture being painted for Daniel. And so it ends with, well, it talks about the temple. Let's go take a look at Daniel 9, 24 and just confirm what we're seeing here. And I never saw anybody call this out before, but I think because we're looking at the people and the consummation for the Jewish people, and now we're looking at the temple, maybe this is going to be interesting for you. So in Daniel 9, 24, he's talking about these 70 weeks that are determined upon thy people, the Jewish people, and upon the holy city. Okay, there's the second part. To finish transgression, to make an end to sin, to make reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness. Boom. What that's saying to me is, if you accept Christ for the Jewish people, that's going to make the end of sin, the atonement form, right? To make a reconciliation for iniquity, while they rejected Christ, at the moment he returns and they accept Christ and they pass through the final Yom Kippur, that will be the final reconciliation of God and his, and his people, right? Bring in everlasting righteousness. Who is our righteousness? It's Christ. He's going to be on the throne. Check, you know. And seal up vision and prophecy. I think it's going to be the fulfillment of what was promised. But here's the curious part. The very last thing in the list is to anoint the most holy. And we'll take a look at this again. <clears throat> in this, uh, Let's take a look at this actually in the ISV. Because that reference there is to the holy place. And I just want to give you a contemporary translation of that. And to anoint the most holy place, which is means the um, sanctuary, the inner sanctuary is going to be anointed and set up again. So the temple is there and the inner sanctuary is holy again. So that's the end of the 70 weeks. You follow what I'm saying? The 70th week ends when Christ returns to the city. Yep and when the holy place is anointed. So I'm just going to make this point here that um, this, the 70th week of Daniel, the end point is going to be when the temple has been anointed. That's what I, I think we're learning here. And I, just a little bit of speculation. When the predecessor Antiochus Epiphanes defiled the temple, um, you know, back there in 167 A.D., Hanukkah was the celebration of the eight days of the cleansing of the temple, and it was anointed again at that point. So I, I'm sort of wondering, because you know how these feasts go. They're the fall feasts. It's Rosh Hashanah, um, 10 days of awe, Yom Kippur, four-day break, as we saw there, then eight days celebration of tabernacles, that's month seven on the Jewish calendar. Now, month eight is really interesting here. Let's just go take a look what happens after all of these feasts and all this type of thing. Okay, I'm going to put in now month eight, and I just want to show you some neat things. So right away in month eight, the first Sabbath <clears throat> is the Sabbath of Noah, basically, which means to rest. What just hap what just completed 
they complete the tabernacles. It's the time of rest coming. Watch this. All these Sabbaths in a row. Next one is Lek, Leka, Leka, something like that. Help me, someone. <laughs> And this Sabbath includes the uh, celebration, which means to go out. You know, so now is this possibly giving us a hint of after their rest in the Feast of Tabernacles, after the Jews at the end of the age have been judged, is this next celebration, the next Sabbath, means go out. Now Christ is going to lead them back into the Holy Land, right? Okay, <clears throat> let's go take a look at the next one here. Vaira. And then, he, and he appeared. And so I, I think, um, you know, is this the entry of Christ through the eastern gate, <laughs> right, for the final time in Jerusalem with the Jews, re, the already judged out Jews returning with them. So you can see how there's potentially 30 days there from the final judgment of the Jewish people to their entry back into um, Jerusalem and then the, the temple being anointed. Okay. Coming back to our outline here then. So we've got time, times and a half. <clears throat> completing the return of the Jews that go through the judgment and those final fulfillment of the feasts and then at 1290 days potentially the temple is restored <clears throat> and that finishes the Daniel 70th week because it has to include anointing the most holy now <clears throat> I just suggest you take a look at Ezekiel 40 one through four, as it describes, you know, that process of the temple being restored. Now we got one last one. It's the reference to 1335. Let's go back to the Septuagint version. Starting in verse 12. Happy is the one who preserves and attains to the 1,335 days and you come and rest, and you will rise for your allotment at the consummation of days. That's more clear. It's the allotment is what the 1335 is about. And uh, where what are they talking about this allotment? Well, Ezekiel 40, chapter 40 to 45 is really talking about the dimensions and the description of the final millennial temple. And then, you know, 45 through the end, 48, is really talking about the the feast that will exist in the millennial time frame, the Moeds, in the millennial time frame. But it also finishes with the description of the temple in operation and the land allotment being complete. So let's go take a look at Ezekiel 47. A couple of verses here, quick. <clears throat> it was 13 and 14. This is what the Lord God says. This is to be the territorial border by which you are apportioned the land for an inheritance among the 12 tribes of Israel with Joseph a double portioned portion for their inheritance, distributing everything equally, as if you're distributing things to your own brother, which is how I promised to give it to your ancestors. This is the way the land will fall to you as an inheritance. Just notice that's ISV, but you get the idea. 47, the final promise of the Abrahamic covenant is being fulfilled. This is the allotment of the land. That's what the 1335 is about. So we had the people in the final judgment. Then we had the final restoration of the millennial temple and the anointing of the most holy. And now we're down here and it's about the land allotment that was promised to the children of Israel. Let's just take a look. One last 
verse here, I guess 48, 1 to the end, is uh, the, the description here of the 12 tribes receiving, you know, their their portion, right? And these are the names of the tribes. And it, it talks about here the tribe of Dan, Asher, Naphtali, Manasseh, Ephraim, Reuben, right? And, and the whole way down. And so I think, you know, I can't be positive, saints, but maybe the Holy Spirit showed us something here today is by using the Nets version of the Septuagint, I think we have a description for what these last set of blocks of time frame mean um, in the book of Daniel. And all of this is leading me to think about relaying out a time frame. Um, so part of the aha that happened in here is also what's the terminus, the end point of the Daniel 70th week. It's the anointing of the the temple. And so, you know, in classic timelines, they always put the end of the Daniel 70th week with the second coming of Christ. But that's wrong. You know, it it has to include the anointing of the Most Holy. And I've done several videos, I think it was, but before these things, where I think the Lord showed me. Now, this is a mind bender. If you haven't seen that video, go watch it. But churches in heaven in Revelation 4 and 5. But when you get to the seal judgments in 6, I don't think we've ne we've technically started Daniel's 70th week. I realize the massive destruction that's described there, but go watch that video. I think we've got good scriptural evidence that the 70th week of Daniel actually begins there right at the end of seal 6. So I beg you to go watch that. But I think come back and maybe do a video for those that care that relay out the time frames, sort of plugging in some of these nuggets that the Lord has showed me. Well, saints, um, I know this was a long one, but you know we're breaking some uh, <laughs> new ground and scriptures not of private interpretation. So you have to lay out the whole argument. Uh, especially when you have the likes of Dr. Missler and, you know, all the references he made to all the other theologians. And I went and looked for myself. Nobody was able to describe this. And I'm just going to present this as a possibility with some scriptural backing. Tell me what you think below, saints. You know, all glory to the Lord, because I had given up on this before. <clears throat> I sort of got the tickle in my brain. Go look at those verses again in that Nets version of the Septuagint. And, uh, you know, there I spotted a couple of these little, uh, you know, pointers. So I'll praise the Lord on this. Hope to see you soon, saints. God bless you.